So this morning, as we're going through the DocuSign training, please let me know what questions you have. Interrupt me with anything. You can unmute yourself or ask in the chat box. And as I'm going through the training, I'll also stop periodically um, to see if there, if you have any questions or if there's anything I can clarify for you. All right, so here you can see my command screen. To get started in DocuSign, I'm actually gonna go to Opportunities. So I'm gonna click on the icon of the two hands shaking. And then personally for me, when I wanna look at a list of all of my active opportunities, I just like to come up here to the All Opportunities tab. And then I have my opportunity that I've created for this morning's training, 1234 Main Street. You can see over here on the left-hand side, I filled in as much, as much of the information that I have at this point. So the address, I'm the owner, my clients here, uh, estimated list price, commission, all of that. I've also included the property address here. And the reason it's important to fill in as much of this information as possible is because DocuSign will actually pull in a lot of the information from command. It won't pull in everything, but nine times out of 10, it'll pull in your client's names, contact information, property address, sales price, stuff like that. So it just helps make it a little bit easier. From here, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna to go to the documents tab right here in the middle tab here. And then you'll see up here in the top right hand corner, it says start a transaction. I'm gonna take a little pause here because I really wanna highlight how important it is that you get to DocuSign through command by clicking on start a transaction. When you click start a transaction, you are going to sync up command to DocuSign that will allow the two systems to speak to each other and will allow you to upload information from DocuSign directly into command. You do have the ability to start a room in DocuSign directly. However, you're never able to retroactively connect a DocuSign room to a command opportunity. You must always click start a transaction to have that connectivity between the two, two systems. Just wanted to highlight there, just in that way there's no confusion. So in DocuSign, or excuse me, in command, I'm gonna click on start a transaction. This is gonna open up a new browser window with DocuSign. Now I do wanna point out if you have pop-up blockers on, it will prevent the uh, this window from opening. So make sure that you don't have um, a little red box here in your URL bar saying pop-up blocked. If it is blocked, say always allow for command and for DocuSign. So you're gonna log in. So here's my saved password. And now you'll see here, it has dropped me off into my documents tab. Anytime you click start a transaction, it's gonna take you directly here to the documents tab. Now you'll notice that the, I selected a listing for today's template that the exclusive seller listing agreement and the seller's property disclosure form are already preloaded. That's a new feature uh, that the MCA office and I have been able to add that we can go ahead and set up some of the required documents either for uh, a sale or a buyer to automatically load. Now, that being said, if this is your very first time in DocuSign, you have to confirm your NERDS ID to have access to the GAR forms. Your NERDS ID is a number that's gonna tell the system that you are actually a member of a realtor association and that you have the permission to use the copywritten Georgia Association of Realtor forms. You only have to confirm your NERDS ID one time. And there's two different ways that you can do it. So before we jump in and do anything with this specific transaction, let's go ahead and confirm that NERDS ID. The easiest way to do it is if you're already in this documents tab is to come up here to the add button, click add and select DocuSign forms. It's gonna give you this pop-up window that says select forms provider. I'm gonna select realtor. And here it's gonna ask for my NERDS ID, which is a nine digit number. And I've only met one agent so, so far since I've been in this role that actually knows uh, his or her nerds ID. So thankfully, there's a little link right here that says find your nerds ID. I'm going to click on that, open up a new window. And it's going to allow me to use my last name, email address, or license number to look up my nerds ID. 
I'm going to use my last name because I'm not sure uh, my last name and license number because I'm not sure exactly the email address I use when I joined the Atlanta Realtors Association. So I'm going to click on that. And now here's my nine digit nerds ID. So I'm going to highlight this here. Right mouse click copy. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to close this tab. I don't need it anymore. Come back here to command. I'm going to paste that in. And now for last name, you want to make sure that you have the last name that you use when you registered for the Atlanta Realtor Association. If you got married, divorced, had any name change, you want to make sure that you use that name that you previously had when you signed up or reach out to the Atlanta Realtor Association and let them know of your name change because in addition to your nerd's ID, your last name is going to be used to confirm that you are who you say you are and you have permission to use these forms. So once you've put in your nerds ID, your last name, now we're gonna select Georgia Association of Realtors from this very long list of associations. So I'm just gonna go ahead and scroll all the way to the bottom. And then I'm going to scroll up a little bit. They keep adding more and more. So the Georgia Association keeps moving. Just scroll until you find the Georgia Association. Thank you. Pass to this further down. Uh, oh, there we go. Right there. Perfect. Thank you. See you. It? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right there, Georgia Association of Realtors. Click validate. And now it says you have validated two associate two association memberships. If this is your very first time confirming your nerds ID, you'll get a secondary pop up window here that's asking you to confirm um, terms and conditions are to accept terms and conditions of the Georgia Association of Realtors. You would click accept, and then this window here would pop up for you. And you can see I have Georgia Association of Realtors right there. That is way number one that you can confirm your NERDS ID. The most simple, most streamlined once you actually jump into the system. However, if something were to happen to your NERDS ID and you needed to go back and reconfirm it, you can do that in your settings. So up here in the top right hand corner, you can see I have my picture. So click on your picture or your initials. And then we'll go to preferences. And then on the left hand side, I'm going to select integrations. And then it'll show here National Association of Realtors. This should be blank, but it would give you the ability to uh, look up that same information and it would include a link. Um, Actually, let me just click remove and we can go through the process. So I'm going to add integrations. Let's do add provider, realtor, same process here. Now I just got to find that Georgia Association of Realtors again. <laughs> there we go. That simple. So you can do it in either place um, and it's, both times are going to give you access to the same forms. If you do not confirm your Georgia, your NERDS ID, you will not have access to the GAR forms. So just be mindful if you are unable to find the GAR forms, it's probably because you haven't yet confirmed your NERDS ID. Any questions so far on confirming your NERDS ID and getting access to the GAR forms? No, uh -huh. no questions. All right. So I'm going to go back to the room that we created. I'm going to come over here. Here's the room that I just created. And then I'm going to go back to the documents tab. So now let's kind of pretend that we didn't had to confirm. We did not have to confirm our nerds ID and from doc or from command, I click start a transaction and it opened up this room. Like I said earlier, every time you click start a transaction, it's going to drop dump you right here into the documents tab of DocuSign. However, before you actually start adding documents and making changes to documents, we want to go into the details tab and we want to update the information there first. So I'm going to click on details. And the reason we want to come to the details tab first is because all of the information from the details tab is what's going to be used to auto populate our GAR forms. So by updating it here, we can one, make sure that it's correct and two, save us some time so we don't have to manually add it on multiple documents or make changes It'll all be right here. 
The details page is kind of broken up into two different sections. So the left hand side kind of, you know, three fourths of the page is going to be all of the information about the actual property that we are going under contract for or listing. So you can see all of these fields over here, all about the property. And then the right hand quarter is going to be about the actual the people that are included in the transaction. So the seller. So we have seller one here seller two, the listing agent, then we have buyer one, buyer two. So depending on which side of the transaction you're representing, you're able to put your client's information in here. Now you'll notice that seller one, seller two, and listing agent, that all the contact information is already loaded. That's because DocuSign pulls that information directly out of command. So nine times out of 10, nine times out of 10, I will say that DocuSign will be able to properly pull that information out, so you won't have to fill it in manually. However, if you add a contact and then immediately create a room, and then, or excuse me, immediately create an opportunity, and then immediately create a DocuSign room, the system likely won't have time to sync that data, so it probably won't pull into DocuSign, which is not a big deal. You can add it in here. So what I want to do is I'm going to go through and fill in all of the missing pieces of information and all the information that I have to date about this property. So for today's example, we're going to be doing a listing. And the reason I'm going to walk through a listing is because I want to talk through a couple of the um, special forms that are unique to a listing. But we'll also talk through the purchase and sale agreement so that way everything would be the same regardless of which side of the transaction you are representing. So to get started updating our contact information, I'm going to click the edit button up here in the top right hand corner. And now you can see all of these fields are updated. So up here in the top left hand corner, we have our name. Now this name here is going to be the same exact name as the name of my opportunity. And you can see up here at the top of the page, it has the same name. You do have the ability to change the name of your room so that it's different from the name of your opportunity. However, I like to keep them the same. It just keeps it easier, one less thing to worry about. But if you ever wanted to change the name of your room, you can do it right here. So scrolling down, we'll fill in as much of the information that we have at this time. We can always come back later on and fill in anything we're missing. So local currency, I'm just gonna select US dollar, MLS ID. I can just you know add my little MLS ID here. I'm just making up a number for today. Origin of lead, company room status, and eh, it doesn't really make it much difference. Like it's, that isn't gonna affect my um, paperwork. So address, we have one, two, three, four, Main Street, Atlanta County. I'm gonna add Fulton State, we'll select Georgia. They have our zip code, property type. We are going to do residential detached. And then year built, I'm going to select, let's do 2010. Special circumstances, no special circumstances. So listing date, we will list today, the 23rd. Our listing expiration, we'll just give this one month and we'll do August 23rd. Listing amount, I think we have 435. So I'm just gonna copy that. And then I'm gonna paste that same amount into all these different boxes asking for the listing amount. I don't know why it repeats it, I guess, if you have different currencies or whatever, but I just paste it in all of the boxes there just in that way it pulls into um, the listing field or the listing amount field uh, on the forms. Scrolling down, we have our offer details. Well, we don't have an offer yet. We are just preparing the, the property for listing. So I'm gonna leave this blank. High bid confirmation, we don't have any bids. Closing details, additional information. I don't need to fill in any of this because I don't have it yet. Now, property details, if you wanted to, you could fill this in, um, but it's not necessary for your GAR form, so save your time would be my recommendation. So now that we've updated all the information that we have about the property, now we'll go through and double check and update the information for our actual clients. So in the right-hand column, we'll see we have seller one. It pulled in Tony Stark. Here's Tony's cell phone number and email address. It's also going to ask you for their company and mailing address. You don't have to put in all that information. At a minimum, 
you just need your client's legal name and their email address. Their email address is required so then that way the system DocuSign has an email address to send those documents documents to for e-signature. So we have client's name, email address, scroll down. We have seller two, we have Pepper Potts, and here's her email address, which is just my personal email. And then scrolling down, we have listing agent. Here's my name, my business number, my email address, company name. It's going to pull in Keller Williams Realty First Atlanta. One small thing, and this is just a personal preference. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. Uh, where it says company, I like to remove realty. So it just says Keller Williams First Atlanta. We do have permission from Lynn and Alita to do that. And the reason I like to just have it say Keller Williams First Atlanta is because the space, uh, the amount of space on the form is limited and Keller Williams First Atlanta fits perfectly. But if you include realty, it kind of bleeds over um, some of the other words on the form. Scrolling down, we have our address. Just to make sure this is all correct. We look good to go. Listing agent two, if you were also listing this with someone else, um, maybe if you're on a team or you have a partner, you can put his or her information here. Scrolling down, we have buyer one. Now, I'm. this is a personal recommendation. I recommend never adding a co-op, or excuse me, um, the uh, opposite party adding their name or information to a form here. You wanna leave this blank and allow the co-op agent to fill that in. And the reason is, well, Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So just leave this blank for buyer one when you're using when you are using these documents as a listing. Uh, but if you're representing a buyer, you would then leave all the seller, the seller and listing information blank and fill in the buyer. So just scroll down. Now here's the point I wanted to make for buyer's agent. In addition to the actual um, clients' names, I would recommend very minimally filling in information here about your co-op agent. Now, it is very nice of you to fill in a co-op agent's information on the guard form because it's just one less thing for that agent to have to do and it's gonna make your offer maybe stand out just a little bit more or whatever. However, do not send documents for signature to co-op agents directly from DocuSign. Anytime you're going to send a document for signature, always make sure that you send it as a PDF. And the reason that is, is because the way that DocuSign is set up is that if every single person has to sign a document for it to be considered complete, the likelihood is that when you send a document to a co-op agent, there's going to be some negotiations, probably some changes, some updates, some things go back and forth. So that co-op agent isn't going to sign that document. Therefore, DocuSign is never going to um, see that document as being completed and you won't have a copy of it with your client's signature. So it just kind of gets a little messy. Uh, and I'll point this out again later on when we go to send these documents. But I just want to uh, point that out here while we're in the details um, tab as you're, and you're filling out this information. So buyer agent one. Nick, would you say it's better to just leave that blank? rather than even trying to fill in minimal information, just so you don't have any uh, confusion there? Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I guess for now, just leave it blank. It'd be my okay. recommendation. Then we have buyer agent two, scrolling down. Once you get to the bottom here, we're good to go. So I'm gonna click save in the bottom right-hand corner. Now you're able to come back to this details tab throughout a transaction and update information and add information as you receive it. So now that we have this, uh, all the details set up, now we can start actually adding our GAR forms that we wanna prepare. So to do that, I'm gonna to go to the documents tab, <clears throat> excuse me, the documents tab. And then as I pointed out earlier, the listing agreement and the seller's property disclosure are already added making things just a little bit easier, but we still have a couple other forms that we need to include. So um, let's say for my listing that I have today, it also is in an HOA community. So I need to add the community association disclosure. Now, not every single listing is going to have an HOA, which is why that form doesn't automatically pop up. We wanted to minimize 
um, confusion for people that have listings without HOAs, it's not required. So to add that form, we're gonna click add in the top right hand corner, select DocuSign forms. We're gonna get this pop-up window. Then I'm gonna select Georgia Association of Realtors. And this is gonna pull up all 180 GAR forms I have access to, which is a lot. You can scroll through this list. It is very long. What I would recommend doing is just typing in. So I'm gonna type in community and it's gonna, here's my community association fees, disclosures and related issues. I'm gonna select that. To the right of that, you can see it has a form number F322. I would recommend over time, start to memorize those form numbers because you can actually search that form number and it's gonna be really simple. Because let's say if I type in sellers property disclosure. So I already, at, I already have the sellers property disclosure that I need for residential in my uh, room. But if I didn't, there's a condo version, there's a, a lot land version, and there's a new construction version in addition to the traditional sellers property disclosure. So you do need to be mindful and pay attention that you're adding the correct form uh, for your listing and for your transaction. And it lets me know that this one's already in use because it's already added to my room. So I have added my community association disclosure. And then I also want to include the purchase and sale agreement for today. Um, traditionally, as a listing agent, I wouldn't be the one to send over an offer. However, since the purchase and sale agreement is going to be one of the most uh, widely used documents in our real estate careers, I just kind of want to walk through it so you can see how it, how it works and um, get comfortable with it. So I'm going to type in F201. And then here's my purchase and sale agreement. I'm gonna select that. Up here at the top, it says selected two. I can click on it and it's gonna show me the two forms that I have selected. So I'm good to go here and I'm gonna click add selected. The page is gonna reload and everything is going to be added into my room. Now you'll notice that it, there's a room docs folder and that's the default folder in a documents in the room. However, you may wanna organize your documents in a certain way. And I would highly recommend that you do organize your documents uh, in an orderly fashion, whatever works well for you. Lynn and Alita are not gonna look at your room, so it doesn't matter. It can be as messy as you want, uh, but as you go throughout a transaction, you're gonna have multiple documents, multiple versions of documents. So it can get cluttered very easily. So for me, I wanna separate all of my listing documents from all of my um, contract documents. So I want to create a folder. So to do that, I'm going to click on actions in the top right hand corner. And I'm going to select add folder. And I'm going to name this folder listing agreement. Click create. The page will reload. And now I have a new folder. There are two way two ways that you can move documents from the room docs folder into my other folder. The first and most simple is you can just roll your mouse over a document icon, click your mouse down and drag it into the desired folder. That simple. Now, if you wanna add multiple documents, when you roll your mouse over a document icon, this radio button appears in the top left-hand corner. You can select that radio button. So I'm gonna select both documents. And then whenever you select the radio button for a document, this toolbar will appear at the very top of the gray area of the screen and I can roll my mouse over each one of the icons to see what it is. And I can click on the move icon and it's gonna ask me for a destination and I'm gonna say folder in current rooms. And it's gonna show me a list of the folders. I'm gonna select listing agreement and click move. The page will reload. And now those documents are in my listing agreement folder. Now I do wanna point out that every time I add a new document to my room or a document has been signed and completed, it's going to default into the room docs folder. I will just have to move it into, you know, whatever document into the correct corresponding folders throughout the transaction. Any questions so far about adding documents, organizing them, adding folders? No, no questions, thank you. All right, so now that we have our um, room all set up, we have our nerds ID set up, Let's actually go through and start 
playing in the documents and updating them. So I'm going to get started with the exclusive seller listing agreement, my F101. Click on it to open it up. It takes a second to load. Sometimes DocuSign is a little bit faster than others. So that is fine. Let's give it a second to load. And now what we'll do is we'll just start at the top of the document, work our way down, filling in all the information that we have. So you can see here for uh, property, it already included the address, city, county, zip code from the um, details tab. Now I am missing the tax parcel ID number. So I do wanna get that. I can get that from the tax records uh, or from Realist. So I'm just gonna put in my little made up number for today. Scrolling down, we have our legal description. We have a couple different options here. Recommended is gonna be attached as an exhibit here too. And if you don't have, if you're unable to find a legal description or the limited warranty deed from the tax records, you can always reach out to our alliance partners at Campbell and Brandon and McManamy uh, and send them a note and they'll be able to get that for you. So I would recommend clicking attach as an exhibit here too. Sometimes I will also use the same as described in deed book and page. That reminds me, one thing I do wanna clarify this morning. This training is um, on how to use DocuSign. It is not necessarily how to properly fill out GAR forms. For any questions specifically to the content that needs to be added into these forms, please reach out to Lynn and Alita because they are our compliance brokers and a broker and they will be able to tell you exactly what it is you need to include. So I just today I just wanna show you how to use the functionality and click buttons and add information and whatnot. So scrolling down, we have our list price and listing period. You can see it pulls in uh, my list price of 435. You'll notice that there are not any commas in that number. For whatever reason, the, when DocuSign was setting up these fields, they did not include a comma in that number. I don't know. You can add it. And when you click save, it's just gonna remove it. So just be very careful that you're adding the correct number of zeros. Then we have our commencement date. So we'll do July 23, 21. The end of agreement date is August 23, 2021. Our marketing. So we're going to do FMLS, Georgia MLS, and KWLS. Delivery of this agreement. Um, so because we are an FMLS contracted office, we need to fill this in. So our marketing commencement date. So what day are we actually going to start um, advertising this and listing it for sale? So let's just go ahead and we'll do July 24th, 2021. And no more than five days uh, after that date. So by the 29th, I will be sure to have this property listed. I'm gonna scroll down. We have our commission. The seller agrees to pay. I have negotiated 6% with my seller and I'm going to split that with the buyer brokerage so the buyer will make 3%. Uh, no commission adjustment, no separate commission, protected period. I like to negotiate 90 days. Buyer agency, we do not offer dual agency or sub agency. So you can see how super easy it is just to go through. You just click into the boxes or fields that you wanna start typing in or select the boxes. Very simple. Um, we'll just scroll down. I don't need to fill in any of this information. The seller does authorize the broker to assist in negotiations. Scrolling down. Now we get to the part of the GAR forms that just goes into much more detail explaining each field and what it means. So just keep scrolling. Scroll, 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 scroll. Then we have our brochures. Um, it is recommended that you send brochures. <coughs> These brochures just provide more information and more clarity for your clients. Um, they do need to read them at their own leisure. Uh, so I would just select all the um, brochures I want to send. All of the brochures are in 
uh, DocuSign. So you'd add them the same way we did the GAR forms. Our exhibits and addenda. So I have my legal description and I'm gonna make that exhibit A. And then if you have any other ones, you can include those down here. And then we have special stipulations. So oftentimes you're not gonna have a ton of special stipulations for a listing agreement or buy a brokerage agreement, but in the event that you do, you can just type them in here. Super easy, just click into the box and you can start typing your stipulation that you would like to include. Everyone agrees to these terms. So you can fit as many, you can write as many stipulations as you'd like, um, leave them here. So once you filled those in, you can scroll down. We'll see here our client, my client's names and email addresses are both added. Perfect. I'm gonna scroll down. Here's the brokerage information. Now I wanna fill in the remainder of the information that's not here. So everything has to be filled out right here for this document to be compliant. So I'm gonna fill in, fill in here. We have KWFA01, brokerage license number H33313. My licensee phone number, let's do 404-414-8238, fax number 531-5708. I just like to use the office's fax number and then my license number 379-844. And then the office fax number 404-531-5708. And then I am a member of the Atlanta board. Keep scrolling. Now we've gotten to the very end of the document. You'll see this button here, it says save and close at the top and the bottom of the document. Once you've gone through, you've updated all of the fields that you want, you just click save and close. Any questions on filling in the information on the purchase and sale agreement, or sorry, excuse me, the listing, exclusive seller listing agreement? No, right. no questions. Perfect, so I'm gonna click save and close. Perfect. So now everything's been updated to the listing agreement. The next document we're gonna to wanna to walk through for a listing is gonna be the seller's property disclosure. And the seller's property disclosure form is the form that sellers fill out to provide more details on the condition and the, of the home and its systems and appliances. So I'm gonna click on the document to open it up. And just like we did with the listing agreement, we'll start at the top and we'll work our way down. So I'm not gonna update this exhibit letter here because this is actually not yet an exhibit to a contract. Right now we're just working on a listing agreement, not a contract. So I'm gonna leave this blank, uh, fill it in, offer date. We don't have an offer date yet because we're just getting ready to list. But I can fill in any of the information about the listing, all that. So I'm gonna scroll down and you'll see here, we have these fields, what year is the main dwelling constructed? And then there's a text, what should be a text box here and some radio buttons. But you'll notice there aren't any fields here for me to fill in. That is on purpose. As realtors, we do not have permission to fill in any of the disclosures on behalf of our clients. So that is the seller's property disclosure community association disclosure, as well as the lead-based paint disclosure. All of those forms must be filled out by the seller. So when I am in DocuSign, I don't have any permissions to fill in these, form, these uh, fields. So I don't have any places that I can go through and type anything in. So I'm just gonna scroll through just to double check to make sure that there aren't any fields that I need to fill in, um, but I'm just gonna go all the way through. Perfect, not missing anything, there are no fields here. Get to the end, we have our client's names, perfect. I'm gonna click save and close, that simple. There's nothing for me to fill in on this document. Now I'm gonna to go to the community association disclosure. So I'm gonna open that up. And this is gonna be the exact same process as the seller's property disclosure. We're just gonna go through, fill in the fields 
for the information that we have. And then we'll notice that there aren't any other places for us to update information on this document. So here we exhibit binding agreement date. We don't have an agreement yet, so we'll leave that blank. Here's our property address. Again, here's all these buttons and text fields, but we don't have access to them because all of this information has to be filled in by the client. You will put yourself in direct danger and asking for a world of hurt if you fill in this information and anything is incorrect. You would be held responsible. So please don't let, don't let a client try to sweet talk you into filling it in. So this is just one more step or one more way to prevent you from uh, being tempted to do that. So there's nothing here for me to fill out. So I'm gonna click save and close. So now that we filled in all of our documents for our listing, let's go ahead and jump into the purchase and sale agreement. As I mentioned earlier, Traditionally, as a listing agent, I wouldn't be the one to pre prepare a purchase and sale agreement. However, I just want to make sure that you are comfortable and familiar with it. Uh, so that way, when you're working with a buyer, you know exactly what it is you're doing. So this may be a little bit of a wonky uh, process for us to fill it in this morning, but nonetheless, it's going to be the same process uh, that you would use as a buyer, buyer's agent. So I'm going to open up the purchase and sale agreement. Perfect. And just like the previous forms, we're going to start at the top and we're going to work our way down, filling in the information. So offer date. So I'm going to fill in an offer date here. So I'm going to select July 23rd. Now, for whatever reason, since we have this calendar um, fill in here, it automatically adds all these extra time stamps. I'm just going to go through and delete everything after that. I just want the date, July, 20, July 23rd, 2021. We'll go through, just double check. Here's our address, city, county, zip, MLS number. I'm gonna add my tax ID, whatever I made up earlier. I can use my exhibit or my attached exhibit. So that uh, limited warranty deed, if I have that as a legal description or the deed book and page, the attached exhibit is always recommended because it is it has the actual seller's names on it. So I'm going to scroll down. We have our purchase price paid by the buyer. So let's say we have it listed at 435 and our buyers want to offer 425. Perfect. So I'm just going to type in 425. They're going to ask for $7,000 in closing costs. The closing date shall be, um, let's do 8-21-2021. And they want possession of property at closing. Holder of earnest money, Keller Williams First Atlanta. Our closing attorney is going to select Campbell and Branham. And again, I'm just putting um, abbreviations and initials just for time. But when you're filling this out, please be sure to write out everything as clearly as possible. Hey, earnest, Nick. Yes. I'm sorry. On the closing day, are you just randomly you just putting in 30 days from the day that you're writing the, the offer in? or? So great question. It depends. So First, you want to talk with your clients and your buyers if they have a specific date that they have to be out of their current home. Um, if they're selling that home or say their, their lease is up, what day do they need to be moved in? Second, you'll want to um, double check with the listing agent to ask that, that listing agent, hey, is there a certain date that the sellers need to be out by? Um, so that way you can schedule accordingly because they may need to um, coordinate closings for a new home. And you also want to double check and make sure that it is a doable um, time closing time period frame. for both the closing attorney and the lender. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. So if you were to just select 30 days, you would be a okay. That would be more than enough time for the closing attorney and the lender. And everything in real estate is negotiable. So you can submit an offer for a 30 day close. So, I mean, I could just even put, let's say I put September 1st, that's like a 45 day close. We can negotiate on that. And even once we go under contract, 
we can negotiate a change on that close date as, as well. So okay, 30 days is usually the simplest, um, but you, you know, whatever works best for everybody. Gotcha, thank you. You are welcome. Uh, so number seven for earnest money shall be paid. I'm gonna select by check and I'm gonna select B that they're gonna pay um, just 1%, so 4,250 dollars within three days of binding. So inspection due diligence, I'm going to ask for 10 days. I want my clients to have plenty of time to get an inspector in there, negotiate any repairs. Lead-based paint. I, I specifically selected this home that was sold in 2010, so this was not built prior to 1978, so I do not need to include lead-based paint. Um, however, if you had a listing and they you had to include lead lead based paint because it was older than 1978, the process would be the same as the seller's property disclosure as well as the community association disclosure. Scrolling down to our brokerage relationships, we can see here seller's broker is Keller Williams First Atlanta, and you see here see how Keller Williams First Atlanta fits perfectly in that field. If it still had realty in there, it would just overlap and not look as nice. So. So I like have just first Atlanta and I'm representing the seller as a client. And let's say the buyer broker, we're going to select Harry Norman and they are representing their client as a, their, their buyer as a client. Material relationships, as far as I know, this is a standard client relationship for everybody. So I'll put NA, time limit of offer. I'm going to put 12 PM and let's do um, 7, 24, 20, 21. So we'll give them till noon tomorrow to respond to this offer. And then we'll scroll through. Now we get to the point of the purchase and sale agreement that just provides uh, more information and clarity on each one of those sections. I'm just gonna scroll, 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 scroll. Doo -doo -doo. All right, now we get to our exhibits and addenda. For whatever reason, I don't know why the all cash sale exhibit is always checked. Just uncheck it. Um, so we are going to include the seller's property disclosure on here. So I'm going to make that exhibit A. Then we have our community association disclosure. I'm going to make that exhibit B. And then for pretend sake, I have the legal description that I had used um, for my listing. And I want to make this exhibit C. You would also want to include your financing exhibit. So whether they're using a conventional loan, FHA loan, VA loan, or all cash, you would want to include that as well. So I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to come here to the special stipulation section. So I'm going to type in any special stipulations and say um, seller agrees to leave the um, let's see the uh, landscape timbers in the backyard. Seller will have the have all of the gutters on the home cleaned and cleaned and pressure washed. So whatever stipulations you want to include here, type them in. Now you'll notice this is not a lot of space for special special stipulations. I don't know why that when the Georgia Association of Realtors designed this form that they made it this small. I guess they were just trying to discourage people from using a lot of stipulations because uh, my only rationale. There are two workarounds for this if you, if you need more space. The first workaround is when we go into the envelope and we're preparing this document to actually send for signature. We can add a text box and then we can make the font smaller so we can fit more text in this area. Now, and I'll point this out again in a few when we get there, but it's not going to earn you any any friends on the co-op side or at the closing attorney because you're going to have teeny tiny little font um, for something that's fairly important. The second option, and this would be my recommended option, is you'd want to click the additional special stipulations are attached. And this is another form that you would add, just like we did the listing agreement, disclosures and purchase and sale. And this is gonna be a whole form that's blank and you can go through and add in as many special stipulations as you want. So I'm gonna uncheck that for now. 
Then we're going to scroll down. Now we get to our contact information. So we see here we have our client's name and email address, client's name and email address. Now this is a personal preference of mine, but I do not like to share my client's contact information with any co-op attorney or any co-op agent, regardless. I don't want that co-op agent to have the ability to reach out to my clients directly. Now I'm sure that most of the time co-op agents are going to be very respectful of the relationship that I have with my clients. However, there's always going to be that one agent you're going to work with sometime throughout your career that's going to try to be a little shady, be a little snake and go around you and try to negotiate you out of the deal for savings for your client or whatever. So my first inclination would be to just delete the, co the contact information right here off this form. However, do not delete their email address. Whenever you delete or update pre-filled text on any GAR form, it will make that same change to the details tab. So if I were to, if I were to delete that contact information off this page, it would delete the email address off the details page. Thus, when I go to send this document for signature, there would not be any email address in the system for me to send this to my seller. And as an e-signature platform, we need, need an email address to send it to. I will show you in the envelope how we can hide and protect our client's contact information. But I do just want to point that out, personal preference of mine, but do with it as you want. I'm going to scroll down. We're going to fill in the rest of the information. So here's my information over here. I'm just going to fill in any missing fields. Now you can see that all this information, broker's phone number, fax number, office code, broker license, all that was filled in on the listing agreement. And so it was pulled in to this form. So all these different fields are mapped across the different forms. So that way you only have to fill it in one time, just to make things a little bit easier. Now we had talked earlier about not adding in the co-op agents information into, into the details page. And I still stand by that and that I don't want you to ever send a document for signature to a co-op agent through DocuSign. However, if you're submitting an offer, you want to do everything that you can to make your doc, your offer stand out. And sometimes the simplest things can make, could be what makes or break your makes or breaks your offer. Filling in that co-op agent's information here is just going to be something that's going to save them two minutes of time, but it's also going to show that you are a, um, a good agent to work with. So I would actually recommend when you get here to the purchase and sale agreement to fill in all of their information. You can get this information out of FMLS. So I'm just going to type in um, Jane Smith, license number one, two, three, four, five, six. I'll just go through, just type in all of this information. Now, you can add their email address and it would give them the ability to send this document, but we do not want to send it at, um, send them an email. So we'll just type in everything we know here. Whatever. So you get the point. Any little thing can make your offer stand out. And I always want to make sure I do everything that I can to get my offers client to the top. And I don't want anything that I've done be the reason why their offer did not get accepted. So that's just personal. You can do however you want, whatever works best for your business. Um, but I would just recommend filling it in. So I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom and now we have our save and close. So I'm gonna click save and close. So we have gone through and we have filled out all the information for our listing agreement, double checked our disclosures and updated our purchase and sale agreement. Any questions on adding or updating any GAR forms in DocuSign? All right. No, no questions. You do? No, no questions. Though. Okay, awesome. So our next step is we have to send these documents for signature. And the way that we send them for signature in DocuSign is through an envelope. And the way that Michael New explained envelopes to me 
and I really like it, so I like to share this example, is think of envelopes in DocuSign as a manila envelope in real life. And imagine that you had gone through, printed out all of these GAR forms, you wrote everything out by hand, and then you organize them and you put them in that manila envelope on the edge of your desk, just waiting there. And then when you see your clients, you hand them that envelope and say, please review and sign these documents. An envelope in DocuSign is the same thing. It is just a vehicle to send the documents for review and signature. There are two ways that you can create envelopes and I'll show you both. The first is if you select a document by rolling your mouse over and clicking that radio button, the toolbar will appear up here at the top of the page. You can roll your mouse over the icons and go to the create envelope icon. This will create an envelope with just the selected documents. This is as you get further along in a transaction, you're going to have a lot of documents in your room. So this is what I would think might be a little bit easier uh, when you're so that way you don't have to wade through 25 different documents to make sure you select the right one. So you can just select the document and then create envelope. The second way you can create an envelope is by clicking on the envelopes tab. And then in the top right hand corner, I'm going to select new. And this is going to walk me through creating an envelope. And so if if I had previously selected that document and click create envelope, it would take me to this page. So it'd be the same thing. So with everything in DocuSign, we're going to start at the top and we're going to work our way down. So our envelope name, give this envelope a specific name. You, throughout a transaction, you're, you can send 20, 30, 40, 50 envelopes. Um, and you want to make sure you can keep track of them because there may be some times where you have to go back and double check and say, oh, hey, client, you actually signed this document on July 23rd at 11.15 a.m. So, but if you have 25 different please DocuSign envelopes, you'll never be able to tell which one is for which transaction. So I'm going to name this one, two, three, four, Main Street, Exclusive Seller Listing Agreement, and Purchase and Sale. I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to get to the add documents to the envelope. So we have three different options here. We have room docs, use a template and more. We're going to walk through all three options. Room docs are going to be all the documents that we have in our room. So the four documents that we have just previously worked on. So I want to add those documents from my room. So I'm going to click room docs here. And I'll scroll down. And it's going to show me all of the documents that I have in my room. So I have my community association, my listing agreement, my purchase and sale, and my property disclosure. I'm going to click add selected. And it's going to add all four of those documents. So we'll just give them a second to load. Perfect. Now, there are two other documents that we have to include uh, when we send out a buyer brokerage agreement or a listing agreement. And that is the Rawls Group Affiliated Marketing Disclosure and the Rawls Group Wire Fraud Prevention Disclosure. Those two documents are considered a template. The reason that they are a template is because when the MCA office added them to DocuSign, there aren't any actual fields for you to fill in. So it's not a form. It really is just a document that you need to send for signature. So to add that to our envelope, I'm gonna click on use a template I'm gonna select shared with me. And we'll give this a second to load. Now, the way the DocuSign on the back end is set up is something that's kind of weird. Um, so it's probably gonna load a ton of documents that have nothing to do with our market center. We will just ignore those. We'll let it load. There we go. So you can see all these ones here, like a dent. Well, I don't know what any of this stuff is. We don't need it. Um, but here we have our affiliated marketing disclosure and our wire fraud prevention. But see, it says buyer dash. I'm gonna scroll down and then I'm gonna have a seller version of those same documents. So seller version affiliated marketing and seller version wire fraud. They are actually the same document. However, 
because depending on which side of the transaction you're working on, you want to add that version of the disclosures because um, the signature, signature fields are mapped to those roles. So I'm working on a listing, so I have seller one and seller two. If I were to have added the buyer version, there wouldn't be any place for the my buyer, or excuse me, for my sellers to sign because those signature fields would be mapped to a buyer. So I'm gonna select seller affiliated marketing and then click add selected. That's gonna add those two templates to my envelope. There we go. All right, and then our last option here is more. So I'm gonna click on more and you have the ability to upload a document. So if you have a PDF from your computer, uh, let's say there's a document that you have downloaded from FMLS or that you received from a, a co-op agent, you can upload that this way and we'll add it to the envelope. Now you'll notice all of these forms are just added in um, alphabetical order. I want to send these forms in a very specific order to my clients. So I want my clients to, to fill out or to sign the listing agreement, then fill out my seller's property disclosure, then community association disclosure, then my uh, affiliated market and wire fraud disclosures, and then have my purchase and sale be the last form they review and sign. If you wanna put these documents in a specific order, you have to do it here at this stage of creating an envelope. Once you click next and come back, you won't be able to reorder them. I don't know why, it's just a weird function of DocuSign. So to put your documents in a specific order, just roll your mouse over the document icon, click your mouse down and drag it into the position you want. That simple. So we have our listing agreement, then I want my seller's property disclosure, then my community, community association disclosure, then affiliated marketing, and now I want my wire fraud and then my purchase and sale. So now I have them in the order that I want for my clients. So we are good to go here. Any questions about adding documents to the envelope? All right. Scrolling down, our next step is gonna to be to add recipients to the envelope. To do that, we're gonna click on the add recipient button here and it's a drop down menu with three options pre tagged roles, room participants, and email address. Anytime you see pre tagged roles as an option, always select pre tagged roles. It is very important that you select pre tagged roles because every single one of these GAR forms in DocuSign has every single, every single signature field, initial field whatever field mapped to these specific roles. So seller one, seller two, listing agent, buyer's agent, everything. If you do not select pre-tagged roles, you will then have to manually add every single signature field and initial field on all these documents. And that's gonna take an unnecessarily long amount of time that you could have avoided. So whenever pre-tagged roles is an option, always select pre-tagged roles. The next option is room participants and room participants are going to be people that we've added to the details page that are part of the room. And this is when we want to add them because we've uploaded a PDF or document that doesn't already have the roles mapped out. So we'd select room participants and then we'd go through and manually add all of those documents. Email addresses is if you just want to add someone that you just want to send it to them um, that they're not included on the details page. Um, they probably may, they may not have um, any place to sign, or if there's maybe a third signer, third or fourth signer, um, let's say there's four sellers for this home, you can add email address and then add those multiple uh, clients. So for today, I'm going to select pre tag roles because I want to make sure that all the signature fields and initial fields are mapped correctly. So I'm going to select pre tag roles. And it's going to pop up this window and it's going to show all the roles that are included in, in, in the document selected. So I'm going to go to seller one. In the middle here, it has a list of the documents. Now, it, it looks like it's just showing affiliated marketing because uh, it's in alphabetical order, but it actually shows 
if you just leave your mouse there, it'll show a list of every single document that that um, role is included on. So I'm going to come over here to the drop down menu and I'm going to select who I want to be seller one. So I'm going to select Tony Stark. It's important who you select as seller one versus seller two. And this may be a conversation that you want to have with your clients because seller one is going to be the client that is responsible for filling in, filling in all of the information on the seller's property disclosure and community association disclosure. So just make sure that whoever is seller one is fully aware that that is going to fall on them to fill that in. Seller two, I'm going to select Pepper Potts. And then listing agent, I'm going to select myself. Now your name is probably going to be in here twice. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Pick whichever one. So I'm going to select um, myself here. And like, as I said earlier, buyer, buyer agent, you may feel compelled. Oh, I can just go ahead and send this to the buyer agent. Do not. Do not, do not, do not, do not. Unless you and that co-op agent have had a conversation conversation that said, we will agree to these terms, please send over directly for signature. Do not send anything to that co-op agent for signature. So once we've added all of our participants, I'm gonna click add selected. The page is gonna load and it's gonna add them here. All right. So there's a, a bit of information here for each one of these boxes. So let's walk through it. To the left of each one of these recipient names and email addresses is a box and it has a number one in it. This box on the left hand side is the signing order for these documents. So whenever you add recipients, it's going to default to one, which means that everyone is going to be able to sign that document at the same time. However, Sometimes you may want there to be a specific order of when someone signs a document. So for today, I actually want Tony Stark to be the first signer because I want Tony to be able to go through, fill in all of the information on the disclosures. And then, then I want Pepper to be able to review, double check everything is correct and then sign. And then I want the documents to come to me so that I can sign and I can bind the listing agreement. It just makes it a little bit easier uh, one less step. So to update the signing order, just quickly uh, highlight the number in the box and update the number and it will automatically reload the order. So I'm going to click myself as three and now we have it in the correct order. We just double check the client's name and email address. To the right of that, we have a drop down menu and it's going to default to needs to sign. This drop down menu has a handful of different permissions. So the first is needs to sign. That's pretty self-explanatory. They have to sign the document. The next is the needs to view. This is really if they just need to view the document, double check and make sure that it is correct. I do want to point out that if you select needs to view, that client actually needs to click review documents and open them up. If they don't, it's going to hold up the process. The next is receives a copy. And this is if you just want someone to receive a copy um, of the signed document, have it. Um, this may be useful for a lender or a closing attorney, uh, but I would also recommend that you have you only use this with closing attorneys and lenders that you have relationships with, so they know to be expecting documents. And last is specify recipient, which you don't need to worry about. And then to the right of that, <clears throat> to the right of that, we have another drop down that says more, and there's two options here. The first is to add access authentication. If you're working with a client that is uncomfortable with e-signature, they're concerned about privacy and security, you can add an access authentication code that's going to add an extra layer of security to ensure that no one's hacking into their email address, no one is signing documents and buying a house on their behalf that they don't know about. To add that code, click add access authentication and you can enter in a code here. So I can just type in one, two, three, four, five. I can make up whatever code I want. Then I would tell Tony, hey, Tony, when you receive the email for, uh, from DocuSign, you're going to have to type in the code 12345 before you're able to review and sign the documents. That simple. I'm going to click discard because I don't actually want to use it. And then the next option is add private message. And this is going to allow you to write a message specifically to that one person. 
Now, since Tony is going to be the one responsible for filling in the disclosures, I do want to write a quick message to Tony. It says, hi, Tony, please be sure to fill in the disclosures. Thank you, Nick. Perfect. So that's a quick little message to him. Any questions on adding recipients, putting them in a specific signing order or updating any of the permissions? Yeah, just a quick question. When you were uh, mentioning seller one versus seller two, is that something that they just completely decide or is that something legally that they would have to, someone would have to be first over the other? So it's not a legal thing at all. It's okay. really just more of who wants to be responsible for filling in the information. Okay, got it. So yeah, you can ask them to say, hey, I'm gonna send over these forms with the listing agreement, the sales property disclosure and the community association disclosure. Both of them require you to fill in all the information to provide more clarity for the potential buyer. Only one of you has the ability to fill them in. Who wants to be responsible? Okay, it's just a matter of their decision. You want, okay. Yep. yep. All right, so scrolling down, our last step here in our envelope creator is to add a message. The email subject is going to default to please DocuSign. I recommend that you leave that in there just in that way uh, your clients are fully aware that this is a DocuSign email that they're going to need to review. And then I would add the property address, 1234 Main Street, and then seller listing agreement and purchase and sale. So they know what forms they are going to be reviewing and signing. Now, I imagine you will have already had a conversation with them saying, hey, seller one and seller two, I'm actually putting together a listing agreement. I'm going to send over these forms for you. Please be in the lookout. And I'll send you a text message once I'm able to send those over. Then I'm going to add a little message. Hi, Tony and Pepper. Please review and e-sign the forms. Please let me know what questions you have. Thank you, Nick. Nice little simple message, nothing too long. And so we've gone through, we've given our envelope a name, we've added documents to our envelope, we've added our recipients and put them in a specific order. And now we've added our, an email, a quick little message. Our next step is to go into the envelope editor and double check and make sure that all the signature fields and initial fields are correct. To do that, I'm gonna click next. This is going to update the envelope or pull up the envelope editor. Give it a second to load. Doo, doo, doo. Perfect. So there's a bit of information we need to talk through on the layout here before we actually start doing anything. So up here in the very top left hand corner, there's a little back arrow. So in the event you need to go and change something or go back, you can just click here. DocuSign does save your changes every couple seconds, so you should be good to go. To the right of that, we have our document name, just to double check. Below that, we see here, it says Tony Stark with a dropdown and it has a yellow dot. And then you can see all of these fields down here are, have a little yellow icon. If I click on this dropdown menu, you'll see that each recipient has a different color coordinated. That is so you can more, easily identify who is responsible to fill in or sign which field. So if I click pepper, all of these fields turn blue. So I know anytime I see a blue field in the document, it's assigned to pepper. And then myself is purple. Again, just makes it very easy to identify. I do want to point out that these colors, yellow, blue, and purple, they are not, Tony is not always going to be yellow and pepper is not always going to be blue. It really just depends on the document. It doesn't matter. Um, it's really just so you can easily see who's responsible for what in each envelope. So I can see Tony, click on yellow. These are all the standard fields of information. If I wanna add any fields, a signature, initial, name, email, all this stuff. Easy to add and we'll do that in just a moment. In the middle here, we have a preview of the document. If you need to zoom in or zoom out, you can do that here. If you need to undo or redo um, any actions that you've changed here, you can do that as well. Over here on the right-hand side is a thumbnail preview of all the documents. So you can see here, we have our, all the documents in the order that I had placed them in the envelope previously. 
and you can expand and minimize and you can scroll through each one of the documents. Now you'll notice, scroll through, it's really small. It's fine, not trying to read it. And then here I get to page 10 and it has these tabs up in the top left-hand corner. That is to let me know there is some field that is gonna be assigned to Tony, Pepper, and myself on this document. So I can click here, it's gonna pull up that page and I can see here is a signature field, Tony's yellow, Pepper is blue. I can scroll down here and I hear I am purple. Super easy. Now, um, I would recommend going back to the top and actually scrolling through each one of the documents and just giving it a double check. Because I can see here uh, that somehow I forgot to click the attach as an exhibit here too. Not a big deal. I can check it off here. So to do that, I'm going to click my name from the drop down. So it's purple. I'm going to click checkbox and then I'm just going to add that checkbox right here. And then I want to go ahead and double check it. And then because I want this checkbox to appear when everyone signs it, I'm going to select read only. I don't want anyone to be able to change it, myself included. It's that easy to add a standard field. But just you want to double check to make sure you're not missing any fields. So continue to scroll down, make sure everything looks good. Good to go here. Do, 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 do. All right. So everything looks good. I'm just going to skip down to the last page. Email our signatures all look good here. Now I mentioned before, I'm going to be the third and final signer. So I can actually make this listing agreement binding when I sign. And the way you can do that is by adding a text field. So if I come here, I can add a text field right here in the binding area. So I'm going to format that to fit, put it right there. And you can see how it's highlighted purple. Whenever you select a field over here on the right hand side, there's going to be a menu and it's going to default to required and read only. Required means that someone is going to have to fill in, someone being me, it's assigned to me. It, I'm going to have to fill in information in this field in order for me to complete my signing process. Read only means that it's just going to show up. Nothing has to be done to it when, when signing. So I added my text box here. Another feature that I really like about DocuSign is that I can right mouse click, click copy, paste, and I can just go ahead and add a pre-formatted field. I can just copy it, good to go. I'm gonna do the same thing. Let's just go ahead and click paste. I'm gonna add that over here. Actually, you know what? I don't wanna use a text field here. I'm gonna use the date signed here field. So I'm gonna click date signed. I'm just going to add that right here. And this will automatically add the date when I sign. Any questions on adding text fields or anything here? No, I'm good. All right. So we're going to go to the seller's property disclosure next. So I'm going to expand that. I'm going to click on it. You can see here it has a yellow tab. So that, that lets me know that there's something assigned to Tony here. So everything looks good here. And now I'm going to scroll down and you'll see all of these text boxes and radio buttons are outlined in yellow. That means that they are assigned to Tony. However, they're just outlined. They're not filled in with yellow. And when an, when an item like this is just outlined, that lets me know that it's not a required field. That when Tony goes to sign, the system is just going to jump from required field to required field, which will more than likely just be signature field, signature field, signature field. And it's going to jump over all of these fields that he actually needs to fill in. A cool little workaround that you can do is on um, the seller's property disclosure. On this field here, it says, what year was the main dwelling constructed? You can click on that field. It's gonna pull up the menu. And on the right-hand side, we can click required field. Now this text box is filled in yellow. When Tony goes to sign, the system is gonna stop here and say, Tony, you have to put in a date, a year here. And then it's going to be much easier for Tony to then scroll down and click all of the rest of the buttons and fill in all the rest of the text. So that's just an easy way that you can get the system to stop there for Tony to fill that in. Now I'm going to uh, scroll through the rest of the seller's property disclosure, make sure everything is correctly mapped to Tony. 
there's not anything missing because I want Tony to be, be able to fill out this disclosure as accurately and honestly as possible. Keep scrolling. Everything looks good. It's properly mapped. Get down here. Then Tony and Pepper both have signature places. Perfect. Good to go. I'm going to keep scrolling and now we're going to get to the community association disclosure. And you'll see everything here is mapped to Tony in yellow, but it's all outlined in yellow, not filled in. So none of it's required. However, I'm not exactly sure what type of association Tony's neighborhood has. So I don't want to make this text box here mandatory. What I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll down to the contact information for the association and where it says name of association, I'm going to click that text box and I'm going to make that required. This way, the system is going to stop. Tony can fill in the information and it's going to be much easier for him to scroll up and fill in the correct information for the type of association and any other association fees. I'm going to continue to scroll down just to double check, make sure everything is properly assigned to Tony. There's our initial fields, good to go. Now we have our disclosures, signature fields, perfect. Signature fields, perfect. Now we have our purchase and sale agreement. We're just gonna double check everything, make sure it's good to go. All this looks good. Here's our initial fields at the bottom of the first page. Keep scrolling, keep scrolling. Doo -doo 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 -doo. We'll get there sometime, I promise. All right. Here we get to our exhibits. So we'll just double check and make sure everything is checked and we have an exhibit letter. The next we have our special stipulations. So I mentioned before, there's kind of two workarounds for the limited space. One workaround is adding the additional stipulations by clicking that box there. Or what you can do is you can add a text box here and make the font smaller. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a text box. So I'm gonna select myself from the drop down, so it's purple. So I know it's assigned to me. I'm gonna click text box. It's gonna add that text box here and I'm gonna format it to fill this whole space. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type in all my text, uh, so all my stipulations. Here are some more steps, more steps, even more, lots of them, more and more. Now you can see here, I have spe enough stipulations that this little text box has to scroll. However, a PDF does, cannot have scrolling boxes. So what I can do is I can come over here to the formatting section of, this, uh, of the menu, and I can change this font to seven font. Now it's kind of small, but it all fits there. So this is what I was saying is it's probably not gonna earn you any friends, um, but you are able to fit more into that space. And then the last thing I wanna do is up here where I'm gonna uncheck required and I'm gonna check read only. The reason I want it to be read only is because when my client signed this, I want all this text to be here. If it's required for me, it's only gonna show up after I sign. So by having it read only, everyone will be able to read it and double check that it matches what we discussed. Scrolling down, we're gonna double check our client's names, signature fields, perfect, good to go. And here are our client's emails on our purchase and sale that I'm gonna share with that co-op agent. I told you earlier, I'd show you how to hide them and protect our client's privacy. The only way and only work, workaround I've been able to figure out in DocuSign is to add a black bar over our client's email addresses to block it out. To do that, I'm gonna come over here to the icon that says pre-fill tools and then I'm gonna select the line button and I'm just gonna drag a line over my client's email address. Click again and I can change some of the options over here. So I'm gonna select color, I'm gonna make it black and then thickness, I'm just gonna go ahead and scroll this all the way to 10. And then I'm gonna drag this so it properly covers the entire email address. There we go. I'm gonna right mouse click this, copy, paste, and I'm gonna add the second bar over seller two. So now 
the co-op agent will not be able to see my client's email addresses and I'm still able to send all these documents for signature. Scroll, make sure everything looks good here for myself. Now we've gone through, we've double checked all of our forms. We've added in some text fields, made some required um, and um, secured our client's privacy. Our next step is to send this to our clients for uh, signature and review. However, before you do that, if you want to double check what it's going to be like for your clients to actually sign, you can click on recipient preview. And this is going to open up a quick, a quick preview. And at the top here, we have what it's going to look like on a desktop, what it's going to look like on a tablet, and what it's going to look like on a, a phone. Now, let's say if you were in a multiple offer situation, things are moving quickly, and we you have to get that offer over ASAP, and your clients had dinner reservations at a place they've been looking forward to going to, and they don't want to cancel to be at home to sign this document, they can sign on their phone. Um, so you can just let them know, hey, while you're at dinner, you can just take three minutes and you can pull your phone up and you can actually go through and sign. That being said, it's not going to be the most pleasant experience. You can see it's kind of hard, nearly impossible to read. Um, but they do have the ability to sign. And then you can also double check what it's going to be like for each participant. So I can pull up what it's going to be like for Tony. And I can click start and it's going to pretend jump me from line to required field to required field to required field. So just if you want to double check, it's our triple check. That's another way you can do that. I'm going to click the X in the top right hand corner. I'm going to close that. And now I'm going to click send because I actually want to send these documents for signature. And I know we're getting close to the end of time. So if you have to jump off at 1130, but I'm probably going to have like another 10 minutes max um, left. So I'm going to open up my email. Let me come over here to Gmail. Doo -doo -doo. All right. Let me come over here. Let's add another cat. Ah, wrong one. I'll just leave that as is for now. And then I'll open up at another KWFA tech, click next, next, perfect. So this is the email that I used um, for Tony. So we'll see here, this email at the top is please DocuSign 1234 Main Street, ESLA and PSA. I'm gonna open up the email scroll down. Here's the private message just to Tony. Please be sure to fill in the disclosures. And then here's the measure message to both Tony and Pepper. For Tony to get started, he's going to click review documents. It's going to open up this DocuSign link. And this is what it's going to be like for your clients to sign. So right now I'm signing as Tony. I agree to use electronic records and signatures. Continue. Click start. It's going to take me to that first required field, which is right here, signature. So I'm going to click sign. It's going to ask me to confirm my signature. They can just use this one, or if they want to draw or upload a signature, they can. So I'm going to do adopt and sign. And then it's going to jump me to that next required field, which remember I made this, um, what year is the main residential dwelling constructed? So we're going to type in 2010. And now it's super easy for Tony to go through and fill in all uh all these text boxes, information, information. And he can just go through this type. Now I'm not gonna go through and I'm not gonna check every single thing because for time, but I just wanna show you what it's like. Um, so he's, Tony's filling this in. Perfect. So that's all I want to do for now, just for time. So I'm going to click next. So it's going to send me to the end to sign it. And it's going to do the same thing here for the uh, HOA. So I'm going to type in name of HOA. And then I'm going to scroll back up just a little bit so I can fill in this information. So it's $1,000 in two installments. And then I can come back down here and I can fill in um, John Doe, just for time, I'm just putting 
nothing there. Uh, do, 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 come over here, you can select some of this stuff. And I'm just checking random things just for time. Do, do, do. Perfect. So next, I'm gonna sign, 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 initial. You can see here that black box um, blocks out my client's email address. And I'm gonna scroll up because I do wanna show you the special stipulations that they're right there because I select uh, read only. So they do show up on my client signs. They are small, so I'm gonna come back here, click sign. Once your client has signed the last required box, this button that says finish is gonna appear up in the top right hand corner at the bottom or at the bottom. Make sure your client clicks finish it's gonna have a pop-up that's gonna ask them if they wanna create a DocuSign account. Let's give it a second. We're gonna click on no thanks. And then you wanna make sure your clients get the your finished signing page. This is what's gonna to confirm to them that they have finished all of the requirements and the next person is now gonna be able to review and sign. If they just sign everything and then they don't actually click finish and get the your finished signing, the system will not think that they're done and won't send the document on. So it just kind of gets stuck here um, in this person, in this client's email. So I'm gonna close this. And then I'm gonna go over here to Pepper's email. So I'm just gonna open up this. Ah, excuse me, wrong. Here we go. Uh, a lot of windows open. All right, so I'm gonna come here to Please DocuSign, so this is Peppers. So Peppers now gonna click review documents. Agree to electronic records, continue, start. And it's gonna jump right to that first signature page. Confirm signature, adopt and sign. And now it's gonna jump all the way to the bottom of the seller's property disclosure. But I'm gonna scroll up because I wanna show you that all of the information that Tony had gone through and filled in will appear when Pepper goes to sign, which is why it's important that you have this order set up. So that way Pepper can go through here and double check and make sure all this information is correct. Because if anything is incorrect, you will be, your clients will be held responsible for it. So that's why it's great that you can have this double check. So click next. Let me just go back, here we go. So she's gonna sign. And then we're gonna to go to the uh, community association disclosure. I'm gonna scroll up just so we can see that. And again, here we have a thousand dollars, two installments. Here's all this information that Tony added and checked here. Everything looks good, required. So we're gonna sign, sign, initial, sign. And now Pepper is done. So let's click finish. No thanks. And now Pepper got the your finished signing. So now I'm going to come over to my email and now I get the please DocuSign email. I'm going to click review documents. Review document. All right, there we go. All right, I'm going to click continue. Start sign and then remember i i can make this binding and i added the um required text field so i'm going to make this 12 p.m i always just do it on the 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 hour for the uh, preceding hour so 12 p.m fill in sign now i'm finished i'll click finish It's going to ask me to sign in. No, thanks. Now I get the you're all done page. You'll receive a copy once everyone has signed. So I'm going to close this window and I'm going to come back over to uh, Tony's email because now you can see here is an email from me via DocuSign completed. Please DocuSign. I'm going to scroll down and all of the signed documents are here attached to this email. Now it's important because Georgia law requires that we send uh, signed copies of everything to our clients for their records. So in the past, we used to have to download them, add them to an email and manually send them. 
the system automatically sends them for you. So it does kind of take one little thing off your plate of things to do. Now, I would still recommend that you organize everything for your clients, but this is just one thing I wanted to point out for you. So I'm going to go back into DocuSign. I'm going to refresh my envelopes page because I want to show you that it says completed. I can click on this envelope and it's going to show me that everyone has signed and the, the date and time that they signed. So I'm going to click X here, the close there. I'm going to go back to the documents tab and then I'm going to scroll down. And remember, I said everything will default into the room docs folder. So we can see we have all of these documents with these green check boxes on them that say signed. Those are the PDFs of all of the completed signed documents. But it wasn't until every single person signed that they are considered complete. Now, since everything goes into the room docs folder, I still want to put all of my listing documents into a listing folder. So I'm going to select all of the documents that I want to include in the listing folder. Select, select, do, do, do. Come over here, select move. Select destination, folder and current room, listing agreement, move. It's going to reload. And now it's going to put everything in uh, the listing agreement folder that I want up there. And then it's going to have my signed purchase and sale agreement down here. Um, the last thing I want to show you is um, right here, it says added. You can arrange how what order you want these documents to appear. The first one, you can have it in alphabetical order, uh, who added, the added it. So it's, I like to have the newest ones appear at the top or the owner. So this way it'll always show the most recently added documents first. Any questions, anything so far? All right. Our last step is to add these documents from DocuSign into command for compliance review. So I'm going to go back into command. Now, because I had clicked, because I clicked start a transaction, command and DocuSign are synced. So I have the really great option is I can just come over here for my listing agreement. I can click add a file. It's going to ask for source of documents, DocuSign. And then it's going to show me my all my documents in my room and it's going to show me my listing agreement folder and I can come down here and I can come to my seller's property disclosure signed and click assign. And it's going to automatically load that form from DocuSign into command. I'm going to do the same thing here with the community association disclosure. Select DocuSign. Actually, let me click cancel on that real fast. So you can go through one by one and you can add each one of these files. But since we have multiple files, we can do this. We can add multiple at the same time. So to do that, I'm going to click attach multiple files. I'm going to select source DocuSign. And then so for community association disclosure, I'm just going to click on this little drop down. I'm going to go down to my listing agreement folder and come over here to where it says community association disclosure signed. There we go. I'm going to do the same thing for seller's property disclosure. Come down to listing agreement, seller's property disclosure. Perfect. Rawls Group Affiliated Marketing. Here we go, Affiliated Marketing, and then Wire Fraud. And then click Attach. And now it loads all those documents directly from DocuSign into Command. Once I've added all of my documents, I come up here to where this button that says submit to MC. I'm going to click submit to MC. This is what's going to let Lynn and Alita know that there are documents in command for there to review. And they're going to provide you feedback, make sure everything is compliant, and let you know if there are any changes or updates you need to make to those documents in order for them to be uh, correct. That is DocuSign training this morning. What questions do you have? What can I clarify? Anything that I can show you again? Uh, this will all be uploaded on the YouTube channels. So we can go back for right. Correct. So I'm going to uh, upload it and I'll send out um, every Friday, I send out a um, training and events email and I include the links to the that week's training videos. Okay, great. All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions or you guys don't need anything, thank you so much for joining me this morning. As you start to play around in DocuSign, 
do not hesitate to reach out with any questions. You can always call, text, or email me. I always try to make it my goal that technology never gets in the way of you winning a deal. So I always want to make sure that if, you, if you're in the middle of signing or sending a document, just give me a call so we can work it out. So that way uh, you can get everything over as quickly as possible. Nick, I did have uh, one question, uh, not yeah. really related to the contracts, but when I go into command and go into adding DocuSign as one of the apps, yep, uh, it says that it's connected and my email is connected with it, but it doesn't show that it's actually connected. Is that something you could help me out with? Yeah, we would um, probably want to jump on a separate Zoom call. Okay. So if you go to the Calendly link in my uh, inbox or in my email signature, we can set up some time and it'd probably just take like 10 minutes to do. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Hey, Nick, one question. I'm sorry. Um, as far as loading these documents on each transaction, is there any way to have like a default folder for, or do you have to do the same procedure every time? So you will have to go through and do the same procedure um, and add those documents to your room. For each transaction. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's but all I, I have. I, thank you. Sorry. I, so over time, you'll learn like, and you'll get comfortable with like, oh, I'm doing a list and I only need these documents. I only need, you know, so you'll know the, the few that you need. And this list here in um, command is helpful to get started for the documents that you will likely need. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Have a great rest of your Friday and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Too. Thanks for your help. You too.